All right, um, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we go along. But uh, I'm going to be talking about, um, well, first, I have no conflicts of interest, so I don't, I don't get any money from any of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I don't, all right. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. I have no money from the pharmaceutical companies, but, and I, but I am going to be mentioning some drugs that are used on off-label uh, indications. So, um, and I'm going to talk about refractory myasthenia gravis, and then if we have time, maybe a little bit of myasthenic crisis, depending on uh, how things go. So, the, the current estimate is about 10% of patients in the U.S. have refractory myasthenia gravis. So fortunately, most patients are started on Meston. If they need be put on prednisone and then transition over long term to Celsept or Imuran and are doing fine, um, and it can come off then the prednisone and then sometimes off in the Mestinon, but about 90% of patients can't do that. Um, so how do you define, and it's important us, for us to define what we mean by refractory myasthenia gravis, both for the patient and physician to understand it also, but when we're arguing with insurance companies about why we might need to do just the non-standard treatment that's used in the other 90% of myasthenic patients. So how do we define it? So um, someone who's unchanged or worse after treatment with uh, steroids like prednisone and a slower acting, slowing actor, slow act, slower acting medication, so azathioprine or Celsip or mycophenolate mofetil, or cyclosporin, which we don't use as much anymore. Um, or the side effects are unacceptable to the patient. Um, and that's often part of the next part, which is requiring unacceptably high doses of steroids. So some patients can't get below 40 milligrams or 30 milligrams of prednisone a day without the symptoms worsening, and that has a lot more side effects than if we can get someone down to just 5 or 10 milligrams a day. So um, that would be considered refractory myasthenia or have frequent myasthenic crises despite being on immunosuppressant drugs. So. Um, so, you know, we often have to define this specifically when we're uh, uh, trying to uh, add on additional immunosuppressive agents or, like I said, spend a fair amount of time arguing with insurance companies. Um, so what are the goals of therapy when we're treating someone with myasthenia gravis? What we're trying to do is, uh, the ideal thing is pharmacologic remission, so someone who's on something like azathioprine, imuran, or mycophenolate mofetil, which is Celsept, and has no symptoms at all and are just taking those medications. Uh, that would be the ideal. Um, obviously, on no medications is the perfect remission, but um, I, I probably don't remember the slide, but Gil Wolf showed this morning, only ultimately about 10 or 15 percent of patients can ultimately go into remission to the point where they come off medications entirely. Um, and then the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, minimal manifestation status. That's the other thing where we're a, a reasonably satisfied with that means that on medications you have minimal limitations. So you may have late in the evening breakthrough through droopy eyelids or a little bit of double vision or when you're really fatigued you may have a little bit of slurred speech but in general you're free of symptoms most of the time can work, can drive, can do everyday activities. So we're many patients we don't get to complete pharmacologic remission we just get the minimal manifestation status but we consider that a success of treatment anyway. Um, so uh, what are some of the possible therapies for refractory myasthenia gravis? Well, um, we, the only one that's approved by the uh, FDA uh, and the European um, equivalent of the FDA is eculizumab or Solaris. Um, and it's the only one that's been rigorously tried in clinical trials so far, and, that, and it does have a now just over the, within the past year or so, it's been approved for use. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, what, what its advantages and disadvantages are. Um, chronic IVIG or chronic plasmapheresis are, uh, are both used often. And, and in fact, the, the value of Gil Wolf in putting together this international myasthenia gravis consensus paper is there's a lack of a lot of uh, clinical trial data supporting the use of, of many of the medicines in myasthenia because myasthenia is pretty uncommon. It's hard to do large randomized trials. So the usual thing we hear from insurance doctors, and I'm arguing often with a urologist or a dermatologist why I should be able to use a medicine in myasthenia um, when they've never even seen a patient with it. But um, the, part of the reason for having this consensus paper is that um, it's a group of international experts to say these things should be considered for use and are reasonable to use and are effective 
in patients with refractory myasthenia gravis. That's the official statement from this consensus panel. Now, you know, sometimes that works with insurance companies. So some, many patients have that experience with get, requiring maintenance IVIG um, and sometimes plasmapheresis as, a, as other medicines. Um, uh, and, you know, but frequently the insurance companies will say, well, it's not in our approved uh, armamentarium for drugs in myasthenia gravis for maintenance. So, you know, we try and use this consensus paper now as an argument, well, there's no trial that supports it, but the international consensus of myasthenia experts says it's a, it should be used. Why aren't you paying for it? So, um, and then rituximab, uh, rituxan, uh, I'll mention Musk. I don't think there were, only, I think no one in here is anybody Musk positive? I don't think so. There's only one person who I think raised their hand up. It's a miracle drug in Musk positive. All of the people in myasthenia recognize that it works fabulously well in the 10% of patients who have Musk positive. Musk positive myasthenia is probably a different type of disease. It doesn't affect the thymus gland. No, patients with Musk don't have thymoma. They don't get thymectomy. They don't respond as well to mesnanon. Um, and they respond incredibly dramatically to rituximab. Um, as I'll talk about, rituximab should be, an, should be almost the ideal drug for acetylcholine receptor positive myasthenia gravis because it attacks the cells that produce the antibody. It wipes those out selectively. The antibody levels often fall considerably, and yet the, the control trial that was just presented recently didn't show a benefit to it. So that's extremely disappointing to those of us in, the, in this field right now. Um, but these are all possible therapies that uh, we think about in refractory myasthenia gravis. So I'm just gonna mention the rapid therapies first. They, they have the advantage, we call them rapid therapies, because they work quickly, within a days to a week. Um, and that we're talking about plasma exchange and IVIG. Um, so they have the advantage, they're very quick to work. The, they also have the disadvantage, they wear off after three or four weeks. So um, uh, the, one of the, potential benefits of rituximab or rituxan is you give a series of infusions and it lasts six months or longer. So that's a lot easier. Um, so um, IVIG, I'm not gonna talk about how it works because the reality is we don't really know how it works. Um, but it's easy to use um, and it may be more easily started than plasmapheresis or plasma exchange because you don't you can just give it intravenously. Sometimes for plasmapheresis, you have to get a bigger line put in to take blood out and then have it filtered and put back in. Um, and how it's given sort of varies by center and by country. Um, so generally, uh, the initial dose that's given is, spread, is given is over two days to five days, depending on other medical illnesses and the practice of that particular person. And then the usual maintenance dose is that usually a lower dose every three to four weeks. Again, depending on the patient, depending on the, the size of the person, that varies a little bit. But the practicality is you have to give it regularly in order to maintain it, benefit from it. Um, plasma exchange is uh, you remove the disease-causing antibodies, which is uh, you're taking the blood out uh, and you're cleaning of the antibodies and uh, giving the white, the white red blood cells back to you. Um, it's, it's often started in variable ways. It's, if you're in the hospital for a myasthenic crisis, it's usually done five or six exchanges over 10 to 14 days. Um, but it can be done as an outpatient. Um, it's harder um, because the, the um, getting good access to the veins um, to get the blood out. Um, uh, and it reduces the immunoglobulins rapidly, but they rebound again, so it has to be done on a regular basis. So um, all, some people are on a regimen getting one exchange every week or something. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, but it has the disadvantage of being harder to do. Um, what about the adverse effects? So um, the adverse effects of plasma exchanges, some people have a big fluctuation in their blood pressure. If they, so if they have really problems with low blood pressure or high blood pressure, can really uh, fluctuate, but one of the biggest, probably the biggest infections is line complications. So if you have veins that aren't adequate, you often have to have a, a, a catheter put in that's a more permanent catheter, and that can get clotted or get an infection, and that can be pretty serious. So that's one of the potential side effects of doing chronic plasma phoresis as maintenance therapy. Um, IVIG, um, most people that IVIG have had some side effects, most commonly headache, chills, flu-like symptoms, 
Um, less commonly, people get rash or uh, aseptic meningitis, which is a much more severe and more long-lasting headache. Um, and fortunately, the acute the serious ones are fairly uncommon. You can get acute kidney injury that usually is reversible. Um, and then you're slightly more prone to clotting. So I think that was more of a problem in the older IVIG formulations um, where it was much more common, but it can still happen getting a clot in the leg, a deep vein thrombosis, or um, uh, a, a, a rare heart attack or stroke. So there, it's not, it's relatively safe, but it's not without complications. Um, Probably the biggest uh, hurdle that we have in using IVIG for maintenance therapy is some of the insurance companies just don't, will just not approve it no matter what. No matter how effective it is, no matter how many experts say it's effective, no matter how many international experts say it's effective, it's not on their list and they just won't pay for it. So um, what about uh, Eculizumab or Solera? So, it has been approved for refractory myasthenia gravis, um, and it's, it's actually been approved just for any form of myasthenia gravis in adults. So in theory, we could give it to anybody but myasthenia gravis, but most of us would withhold it except for people who have failed the usual standard, easy to use immunotherapy. Um, uh, the, because of that, I guess it's less of an issue with the payer, so um, Medicare, because it's been approved by the FDA, would have to pay for it. Um, I know Independence Blue Cross has a policy that you have to meet the criteria that the study had, so you have to fail prednisone and at least one other immunosuppressant for a year, so either azathioprine or Celsep for a year. I think I read that on their website. I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure. Um, and I think a lot of the other insurers will probably follow a similar um, approach to it. Um, and to show it works, basically there was this study, the REGAIN study of 125 patients um, who had significant, uh, and when they were treated, they're given um, their standard immunotherapy, continued on prednisone or salsiprimian, and then given, and they were still refractory, and they were given either eculizumab or, or um, which is Solaris or placebo. And you know, some of the more important differences are how often people are hospitalized. So the people were hospitalized less than half as often with given eculizumab. Um, and w if you consider a significant myosinic exacerbation, it was only 10% only in the treated group versus uh, almost 25% in the placebo group. So there's a pretty significant difference. Now, still it wasn't 0%, but it's it, it, it really a pretty significant difference. Um, I'm, this is the only kind of data slide I'm gonna talk about, but this just shows you the difference. So if, uh, in the trial, um, the top line is the red line is the placebo and going downward is doing better, which is the blue line and dots. So there's a couple things you'll get out of this. So if you look at the myasthenia gravis quality of life scale, so that's the quality of life scale that the patient's asked to fill out. Some of you may have done that. You, see it's zero, you get zero, zero points if you're doing well fine, one point if you're having problems somewhat, and three points all the time. And it asks you things like, do you have trouble um, uh, doing your activities of daily living? Do you have trouble going out um, and using public transportation? Do you have trouble uh, with very, and ask you very questions if you have very, if the myasthenia gravis limits you in certain ways and you fill that at quality of life scale out. And so it's, it's how you feel and report how your symptoms are limiting you in the, your various things you do in everyday life. And you can see that there's a diff, significant difference here between the quality of life scale between the placebo and the eculizumab. Some of these others are less important to you like the QMG is just your muscle strength that's measured by a, um, the physician. Um, and then the, uh, the activities of daily living and the myasthenia gravis at composite score kind of comp combine both symptoms and exams. So no matter how you look at this, you can clearly see just the blue line's a lot better than the red line. The other thing you'll notice, you may have noticed when Dr. Wolf was talking this morning, is that every, all the red lines went down, so, which is interesting because there's a placebo effect um, so if you're given placebo, you're going to improve on your quality of life scale, but not nearly as much as if you're given the eculizumab. So there's two things that show you there. You can do a lot better um, uh, with this drug than if given placebo. Um, so what, that sounds great, but what's the downside to eculizumab? Other than the fact that you have to be in the refractory group in the first place, which is bad. Um, 
uh, why, what is the down, downside? So, and it clearly works. Um, it's, there's clearly beneficial effect to it. Um, and uh, the anecdotal experience around the country is that it's quite effective in most patients as well. So what's the downside? The downside is it's given by IV infusion um, and uh, you have to do it fairly frequently. So it's weekly for four weeks and then every two weeks indefinitely, unless there's some data at some point that you can start backing off on the frequency. Um, so it's a little bit of a hassle. It's, I understand it's a short infusion, less than a half hour. Um, yes? That was going to be my question. How long is it? Yeah, so it's a short infusion, less than a half hour, but it's still an infusion. Um, and the hope would be our home infusion companies can give it. That's the hope um, uh, in most areas. So, um, and the infusions are generally well tolerated. What's the, the main risk of concern is the men, men, uh, meningitis, meningococcal meningitis. So um, there's a, about a thousand fold risk of meningococcal meningitis, at least, at least what I read on up to date. So all the patients who are going to get this have to be immunized with, uh, for meningi meningococcal meningitis first. Um, that for, is a problem in some patients who um, are on multiple immunosuppressants and have gotten rituximab, so you have to wait till the rituximab effect wears off so that you actually can mount an, an immune response and build up the immunity to meningitis when you're given the vaccine. But for most patients, um, they have to get vaccinated first to meningococcal meningitis, just like if you're going off to college as a college student. Um, and then uh, after you wait sufficient time, at least two weeks, then you can start, you know, the eculizumab can be started. Um, any questions more about that? Yes? Is there an issue with people developing the, the immunity to the meningitis because of the low immune system? Is there oh, uh, not in practice. So, yep, the trial required people to be immunosuppressed on prednisone and at least one other immunosuppressant drugs, and they, um, during the trial and since the drug has been approved, there's, as far as I'm aware, there haven't been any patients who have developed meningococcal meningitis. Um, you know, it's always going to be at an increased risk, but a lot of people have gotten it at this point and have not had a problem. Uh, the rituxan is a separate issue, so some patients have been getting rituxan for refractory myasthenia, and that damages spe specifically the kind of antibodies, the kind of cells that would produce the antibodies that would produce, would, that would make you, pre prevent you from getting meningococcal meningitis. So that's a separate issue that we would have to deal on a case by case basis. Wait till the rituxan wore off and that kind of thing. But you're, most patients are going to start this and have received it in the trials are already going to be on prednisone and another immunosuppressive agent. That's what makes them refractory in the first place. Right. So um, it's a good question, but uh, yes? Through your yeah, any, any intravenous. Um, all right. How long does that take uh, to be out of effect? In other words, if somebody's kind of going these downhill, um, does it pop in within a week? Or, yeah. um, you know, because I, I'm the type of person. Huh? Well, somebody during the, I don't know if they're in there, but somebody during the conference says something about it, every person with myasthenia is different. Right. And that, that is the biggest understatement you could make. So, because not only is every person with myasthenia different, every person's myasthenia is different every year of their life. So the first year can be horrible, lots of hospitalizations until get into immunotherapy, and then I have patients like that are on remission and doing fine, and I see them once a year, and you know, for, you know, and then there are people who do, have mild symptoms for a year, and then it, the myasthenia just goes crazy and for a while, and then until, you know, so, and some people respond very dramatically to IVIG, other people's less so, some people have plasmapheresis, um, some people very extraordinarily responsive to prednisone, some people not at all, or require high doses, so there is no one answer fits all. Um, so that's, so I, your question was how quickly does it work? I, all I can do, it's, it's we're talking about um, weeks, not, not days, not months. So you can look here, and again, this is in the average patient, you know, you're seeing most of the drop off within the first four to six weeks. So, um, so you wouldn't use it in an emergency? No, wouldn't you, would not be approaching a myasthenic crisis, no. We would want to use something that's rapid that we know works. It hasn't been tested in myasthenic crisis. Um, we, you know, it might be a reasonable adjunct 
to add on to IVIG or plasmapheresis, but we certainly wouldn't use it as the prime treatment. Now, you know, it's a good question, try me. I would expect, based on this data, it's gonna work in four to six weeks. So a heck of a lot faster than azathioprine or Celsep, which take a year, um, but not as fast as prednisone, which can be just two or three weeks. Well, it may be comparable to that, but um, not nearly as fast as IVIG or plasmapheresis. Yep. Does it work equally well with most patients and uh, It's a good question. So it, we wouldn't use it in musk patients. So musk is a completely different disease. So musk, are, ha, have different kind of antibodies than acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Acetylcholine receptor antibodies have two effects. They block the receptor and cause weakness, and they also activate this complement system that damages the muscle membrane, and that's what this is aimed at. So, you, you know, um, so, so uh, musk is different. It has a different kind of antibody that doesn't activate this complement system that, ta that damages the muscle membrane. So this eculizumab would have no effect or no beneficial effect on um, musk positive patients at all. I mean, in, you know, in theory, the ideal thing would be to combine something that reduces the acetylcholine receptor antibody level and blocks this complement damage to the muscle membrane, you know, attacking both arms, both things that are causing weakness and the... Do they do that to your immune army? Uh, yes, most people, yeah, you do rain on your other immune therapy, but if it was effective enough, then you wouldn't be refractory, so, um, but we don't take people off the prednisone and Celsep to, to put them on aculizumab. Now, if you were doing remarkably better, then we would start tapering the prednisone. That would be one of the main goals, is to get people on more tolerable doses of prednisone, so. Um, I'm, yeah, the, the, the session before this one was on the standard treatments of myasthenia. This is for the treatments for refractory myasthenia gravis. So Dr. Eric Lancaster, before lunch, talked about um, the usual treatments, prednisone, imuran, Celsept, mestinone. So I, I did not, but I'm focusing on just people with refractory myasthenia gravis. Yes, yeah, so Celsept is an interesting story. Um, so how many people are on Celsept, anybody? Okay, um, so Celsept is an interesting story. So you may read about the trials in, in myasthenia don't show that, don't, that don't prove that Celsept is effective. So why do we use it? Because we think it works. So it's an interesting story about how trial, we depend a lot on well-designed trials, like this trial I showed you of Eculizumab or Solaris. Really well done, a lot of patients, taken out for 26 weeks, which is a long time, half a year. Um, and, and the quick-acting drug, that would be sub, certainly sufficient to see the effect. So we, we've used, we were using azathioprine or Imuran for many years as the main drug to replace prednisone with because there's really good data from many years ago showing it's effective. Every, then some people started using Celsept because Celsept has a, lot, has a lot less side effects than azathioprine when you first started. About 15% of patients who uh, start azathioprine or Imuran get a lot of flu-like reaction or bad GI effect or sometimes the liver function tests go out of whack. So many patients, up to maybe 25%, don't tolerate azathioprine or imuran. So uh, Celsep came along in the transplant field and was shown to be really effective. So people started using it in patients who couldn't tolerate imuran or azathioprine and found that they were having really good results, just as good a results of putting people into remission after many months. Um, and many people thought it maybe more, worked a little more quickly for Imuran. So every center in the country went from using Imuran or azathioprine as the first line drug to many places, including us, um, went to Celsept as the first line agent. Um, unless the insurance company wouldn't pay for it or something, then we used Imuran or azathioprine. Um, then there were two trials in Celsept, comparing Celsept, um, just prednisone and Celsept versus prednisone and placebo. So comparing Celsept and placebo, one trial was only three months long and didn't work. Well, we could have told them when they designed it it wasn't going to work because the drug is too slow. So they couldn't show the difference. So they did a nine-month trial comparing the two, and they didn't show a difference. Well, 
the trial was not well designed because they, it was trying to see how low a dose prednisone patients could get at the end of the trial, and they, they were, did not try very hard to try and taper the prednisone, to make a long story short. So there are two trials, neither one shows CELSEP works. Um, uh, so, a lot, so that caused a lot of consternation. So some centers stopped using CELSEPT. Now most big centers still use CELSEPT and azathioprine sort of as interchangeably. Either one's okay. Some places like Duke use CELSEPT exclusively. Um, but there's a lot of data that CELSEPT's effective. So there's a big study out of Duke showing that if you take CELSEPT and you start cutting the dose, and people have been in remission for five years, that if you get down below 1,000 milligrams, a large proportion of patients start to have their myasthenia flare up. So that's pretty good data, pretty good evidence that the cell sept is keeping the myasthenia in remission. So, the, so there's a lot of evidence that shows it's effective. The only two control trials um, couldn't prove that it's effective. So as a, that's a long-winded answer, but most, most experts consider it effective. Not all, but some, most consider it effective, and many people consider Imuran and Celsept as a sort of 1A or 1B, and which one you go to is, you know, usually the preference of that particular person. But, but I don't know if that answers your question. That's a long answer to the question. But right now, as in 2018, almost all but a few myasthenia experts think it's effective. And the international consensus statement says it's effective. Um, uh, but there, there's a little bit of, there was a little bit of controversy a few years ago, and I, most people's uh, uh, concerns have been put to rest and consider CELSEP very effective in myasthenia. Um, all right, so I talked about refractory myasthenia. IVIG, the thing that keeps us from using that most often is the, um, the trouble of having to give a, you know, an infusion every few weeks. People sometimes don't tolerate bad headaches and, and mostly because of insurance companies try and block it in, in some circumstances. Um, I talked about eculizumab, which is very effective, um, but also has the downside you have to get every two-week infusion, although albeit it's only 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, what we thought was rituximab would be the ideal drug. So it's targeted at this, the B cells, which produce the antibodies causing myasthenia. So you wipe those cells out, they go to zero. We measure them in the blood. We do, a, you have to get rituximab, we measure these B cells, and not all your white blood cells go down, so you can still fight infections, but the specific class of B cells that produce the antibody go to zero. And they remain that way for six months. Um, so it seems like the ideal drug to use in acetylcholine receptor positive myasthenia gravis. So what the NIH, through this uh, group, um, uh, uh, organized this trial comparing rituximab versus placebo. And it was just presented at the uh, neurology meetings this spring, and it was very disappointing. So um, they were aware of the problems of previous trials of not trying to taper prednisone down quickly enough. But um, and the 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 the, um, and the what the primary outcome was is could you reduce the prednisone dosing by 75 percent? And uh, they failed on that. So the rituximab basically was the same percentage of patients as, as the placebo. So it, it didn't really give good evidence of its effectiveness. Um, all, the secondary outcomes showed the patients had a little bit better strength, but it's not that dramatic. The, my, the um, myasthenia gravis composite score, which I think is a little bit better than the lower one because it's a combination of symptoms and signs of myasthenia, was a little bit better, but not really very much. So the, you know, this randomized clinical trial of this first drug that seems to be tailor-made for myasthenia gravis um, was very disappointing. Um, rituximab has the advantage you can just give two infusions separated by two weeks, or there's another way you can give it smaller doses over four weeks, and then you don't have to get it for another six months at least. So it, it has, that's a big advantage over some of the other things. But, you know, it, 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 the trial of it is very, like I said, very disappointing. And, it's taken some of the wind out of our sails as to thinking of that in the setting of um, rat refractory myasthenia. So um, if IVIG doesn't work and plasmapheresis is not uh, easily done because of uh, vein access and eculizumab wasn't around and rituximab wasn't around, what did we used to do? Well, we used to often do, if patients who had very significant refractory myasthenia gravis, IV um, cyclophosphamide 
uh, monthly, which is a chemotherapy. You often get that to induce um, remissions in lymphoma and other cancers. So um, high-dose cyclophosphamide given intravenously once a month over six months or so. Um, and it, it, ted, it definitely works in the majority of patients, but it has a lot of serious potential side effects. Um, you're, you drop your white blood counts significantly, you get a susceptible infection. Um, and so that's, uh, it's not without pretty serious side effects. So given the availability of eculizumab or IVIG or other things, we really wouldn't go to that um, uh, currently unless we really had to. Uh, so what are the, some of the other things that um, that are sort of on the horizon. So if someone who's got really severe refractory myasthenia gravis, has failed a lot of medications, um, say d doesn't respond to eculizumab, um, and has still got bad disease, there's, there are potential therapies down the road. Um, I think Gil Wolf mentioned it this morning, a, sort of a last ditch effort. Fortunately, we almost never have to consider something uh, this drastic as uh, uh, stem cell transplantation. So there, there's a series he reported of seven patients out of uh, Toronto, um, and it was a pretty well done study. Um, I think it, oh, maybe out of Ottawa, somewhere in Canada. And it was a pretty well done study of where they, um, they basically take some of your cells out, wipe out your immune system, and then you reconstitute your immune system back. Um, and six of the seven patients had a pretty dramatic response to that therapy. But, you know, you know it's, it's, a, it's the same thing you get if you're getting a bone marrow type transplant for uh, leukemia or lymphoma. It's got, it's going to sort of a very, uh, ser it's a very, uh, it's got a lot of serious major side effects. So um, uh, right now I think that, that was enough initial data that maybe they'll go into a trial, testing it out more widespread in patients with very refractory myasthenia. But, Given the fact that we, we have IVIG and plasmapheresis and eculizumab, um, and I think that would be, uh, you know, something that would be a last-ditch effort. Something further down the road, maybe five to ten years down the road, um, could be one of the, um, um, even, so, it almost sounds like science fiction, but with, it sounds like science fiction in cancer right now, so it's called CAR-T therapy, where they take people's lymphocytes who are refractory lymphoma or leukemia that don't respond to chemotherapy, they take their lymphocytes out, um, they take their lymphocytes out and they, uh, uh, they alter them genetically in the laboratory and, and to target them against that person's specific cancer. So they find a marker in that specific cancer and they give them the back these lymphocytes and that those, your own lymphocytes then attack the cancer and wipe the cancer out and they're having amazing results. It just got approved by the FDA within the past year. Um, Penn was one of the centers that helped develop it. You might see the commercials on TV, they're talking about it periodically. And, um, but um, there are also other companies and other groups right now talking about using it in autoimmune diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, now, why do they not see myasthenia gravis? Yeah, so there's millions of people with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. There's, so most, all these therapies we've, you know, somebody asked about, it's really good to lobby on behalf of myasthenia gravis patients, and both on the governmental level and with insurance companies and everything else. But fortunately, all of these treatments that would work for many of these other autoimmune diseases that are a lot more common, we have been stealing and using effectively. So everything we mentioned, everything we talked about has been used in other more common diseases first. Um, Salcep, azathioprine was developed, Immun was developed as a treatment of RA. Cellstep was developed as a treatment for transplant and other autoimmune diseases. Um, you know, this eculizumab was um, used first in other autoimmune uh, non-neurologic diseases. So um, rituximab was used, developed and used in lymphoma initially, and now it's being used in some other autoimmune rheumatologic diseases. So, um, so uh, a lot of the things that we, we use are going to be developed in other areas. So, CAR T, people are talking about using it and other autoimmune diseases like lupus and um, rheumatoid arthritis, but it would also apply to myasthenia gravis. So you take the set, your own cells out, you alter them genetically so that they uh, produce what are called regulatory cells that then suppress the overactive part of the immune system. So if you, if you know the cells that are causing the rheumatoid arthritis, you send in the cells, your own cells, to turn that switch off. Um, or you can, if you know the cells that are causing the myasthenia, you send your own cells in, you reprogram them 
in a laboratory. You reprogram them and then send them back in to turn the switch off that's causing your myasthenia. I mean, that's, that's a really exciting stuff if it can be happened. Now, it's expensive. I don't know what the CAR-T therapy currently costs. I think it's like a million dollars, but it's, you know, it just started. It's like, hopefully like, uh, you know, my first calculator can only add and subtract and it costs $2,000, you know? So, um, you know, hopefully as it, these things get more common, the price would come down. But I mean, I think that's a longer term thing, but some of the targeted immunotherapies, they're starting with drugs like ecuzumab and rituximab, but ultimately, um, you know, the, the ultimate thing might be to just design your own cells to turn off what's wrong. So, um, so I don't know, anybody have any questions at all? Yep. Um, is osteoporosis a complete contraindication of prednisone? No. Um, there is really no complete contraindication of prednisone. We don't like using it in someone who has osteoporosis. We don't like using it in someone who has diabetes, but if we have to, we do. So, you know, sometimes it's your choice short term between being in the hospital and not, because um, it works quickly. So, you know, and that happens frequently in diabetes. You know, some, probably people in this room have gone from being on metformin to being on insulin because we had to put them on steroids initially to get the diabetes under control until we could get them onto azathioprine or celsip and ultimately get off the prednisone. So it's not a contraindication. We don't like doing it long term. If, I mean, our ideal thing is to deal with the osteoporosis um, in the sh short term while trying to get off prednisone. But, um, and if we can't do that, uh, you know, we try and get as low a dose as possible. So it's, it's you know, any, any of the side, of, prednisone causes a lot of side effects, but it's also an amazing drug. So it's, in any given person, we're always trying to balance the side effects versus the benefits, and you know that's always a work in progress. It may change from month to month and year to year. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but sure. um, yes. Um, do you have any information if they get it from these different medications? Um, probably. Well, I don't have information. They probably on me. On me. They're probably the best thing to do if you can get access to the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation America website. They have a good description of the medications that are used in myasthenia. So, um, and also the medications to avoid um, if you have myasthenia gravis. Yes? Uh, by the way, the support group leader uh, Facebook group mentioned myasthenia gravis news .com as a good resource also. So, myasthenia gravis news news .com. And Medscape and Medline Club. Okay. So, um, yes? Uh, rituximab, is it or is it not chemotherapy? People, it's a, it's a sort of, you see some people, it's just it's chemotherapy, others say it's not, and you have people who say they're gonna lose their hair so they, they didn't have eggs in three inches, baldness, and things like that. Cytoxin is chemotherapy. Is or is not rituximab chemotherapy in the same thing? Um, that's a good question, and they, there are chemo, it's, it's a chemotherapy in that it's used in cancer, and it's a, it's a drug, but there are chemotherapies that are really toxic and have lots of side effects, and there are chemotherapies that aren't toxic and don't have any side, much side effects. So of all the medications you can receive intravenously, um, uh, 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 rituximab probably has the least. I mean, I've given it to a bunch of people, um, especially musk positive patients, and no one's had any, not, you know, not, any side effects you at all. Think you think it's wouldn't, somebody, right? It's not chemotherapy. They argue the point that it is. Right. So you, you. Yeah. Yeah. So it it almost it's a funny medication because yeah. it almost depends on the. Um, uh, context you're using it, so it's one of these unusual drugs that if you use it in uh, autoimmune disease, it's right. not chemotherapy per se, it's used as a immunosupp right. is classified as an immunosuppressive agent. Exactly. If you're using it in lymphoma to wipe out that the lymphoma it. cells, then it's chemotherapy. So, you know, um, if a rheumatologist is giving to a neurologist, it's probably a immunotherapy. If it's an oncologist giving it to you, it's a chemotherapy. So, it's sorry, it, yeah, no, I, it yes, it, it does, and I, I, I think, and I, no, I, I understand, and uh, you know, it's uh, it, do it doesn't have the side effects where your hair fall out, like um, right. you know, we, like uh, other drugs do. So. Doesn't cause neuropathy. Doesn't cause neuropathy like vincristine or some of the taxol or platinum. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't cause bad GI distress like some of the other drugs. So it's, 
um, it's generally pretty well tolerated, I, you know, um, but uh, I don't think, know if I've, I've ever had anybody had any side effect from it, but, I, you know, there's always some infusion-related something to someone, but... Uh, I mean, like I said, I know people that shave their heads because well, that was, I'm almost bald anyway, I'll shave it now, and... Well, that, like, okay. I think that was their excuse to shave their head, for yeah. so, <laughs> so, but... Why not just shave it? <laughs> yeah. Any other, yep. Um, avascular necrosis can occur. I mean, I, I personally have been using it for 33 decades now, and I haven't had a single patient, again, knock on wood, have avascular necrosis. Um, but, you know, it can, it can certainly rarely happen. Um, you know, steroids are as great as they are horrible. Um, so that's why we use them, and that's why we have medicines to get what we call steroid sparing agents to ultimately get you off them if we can, um, depending on your age. So I have a lot of patients who are young, we're taking 10, 15 milligrams a day, you have really no side effects. Um, you know, as you older age, you have other side effects. So you get easy bruising, you, um, you get uh, weight gain is more of an issue, um, the higher the dose. Um, you know, the osteoporosis we talked about can accelerate cataracts. Um, you know, so it can have plenty, and it can increase your blood sugar, which someone who's pre-diabetic makes them diabetic, or someone diabetic can go to metformin, or world medicine like metformin and insulin. Um, so it has plenty of side effects. If you have a higher doses, it makes you irritable, you have trouble sleeping, you sweat too much, you gain a lot of weight. I mean, there are plenty of downsides to prednisone. And I said, if we had an alternative that worked as quickly and as well as prednisone and didn't have the side effects, we would be using it. Um, so, uh, so, but it's still, it's still one of the mainstays of early treatment because it works so darn well and despite all those bad things about it, so. Yeah, it's cheap. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, compared to some of the new drugs that cost t tens of thousands, it's cheap, right? But that's not what we use it. We'd replace it with a more expensive thing if it worked better without the side effects, or worked as well. So, One more yeah. question. Um, have you had medical history from these drugs for whales? I mean, besides studies, I mean, in, in your practice, and, and have there been any potential studies? So the quick answer is no. Um, the I, I have two patients in the process of getting immunized for it. Um, so I have two patients, and then I have one or two patients. So since the rituximab was so promising and seemed so perfect prior to the Solaris being approved, we were treating a number of our patients with refractory myasthenia with rituximab. Some of them have responded, but those few that haven't were waiting for it to wear off to get them immunized to try Solaris. So I don't personally. Um, Gil Wolf, I know he's, he was telling me he had a handful of people, and, and the, the word on the street is that it it's, works pretty good. Um, we have a neuromuscular blog online that people would do this kind of stuff, talk to each other about some newer therapies, and the, so far there's, it's been, not everyone responds, but it's been favorable, so. Any other? I'm happy to answer questions after we take a break, so. Can you tell us the name of that blog? Uh, you can't get onto it. You have to be a physician. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't get onto it. You have to be a physician. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was the general public. No, so unfortunately. So it's, uh, it's so people can discuss case, cases. I have a tough case, this, this, and this. So, yeah. There's no confidential information on it, but they tend to no, no, correct it. So thank you, Dr. Right. Bird.